Good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone to please switch off their electronic devices or turn them on to silent? Item 1, decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items 4 and 5 in private? Yeah, yes. Thank you. Item 2 is the 2016-17 audit of New College Lanarkshire. I'd like to welcome our witness today, uh, Eileen Imla, EIS Fela Branch Secretary from New College Lanarkshire and our second witness Leah Franchetti is delayed in traffic and will join us as soon as she can. I'd like to invite Eileen to make an opening statement to the committee please. Thank you. On behalf of the EIS Further Education Lecturers Association the branch at New College Lanarkshire would like to thank the committee for responding positively to our concern that the voice of staff via their trade unions has not been paid due regard. The EIS FELA is the sole representative body for lecturing staff in Scotland. We believe that colleges are central to widening access to education and that they deliver high quality learning and teaching which enriches the lives of those attending and ensures that society benefits from a workforce which is skilled and trained to meet the challenges of modern life. We welcome the scrutiny of both the business planning process and the sustainability of the plan. We want to engage positively with this process and to work towards a resolution which meets the needs of the community we serve for high quality teaching and learning opportunities, has regard to the working conditions of our members and relieves the pressures that financial concerns place on staff at New College Lanarkshire. The college sector is fortunate to have a successful and proven national collective bargaining machinery in the NGNC, which it can use as a means of delivering progressive outcomes for college staff in partnership with the recognised staff trade unions. Local EIS fellow branches have an important role to fulfil in ensuring that these progressive outcomes are realised in practice. We negotiate locally on areas not covered by the NGNC and support our members with issues that arise on a day-to-day -day basis. We endeavour to work collaboratively with New College Lanarkshire Management and the Board of Management to ensure that we maintain and improve our educational standards and appropriate working environment. It is our wish that an appropriately funded, sustainable financial plan can be achieved to help to facilitate this. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to ask Alec Neil to open questioning for the committee. Okay, thank you, Eileen. Can I just begin with a general question? And that is, it's very clear from the evidence in the report itself and the last session we had that there are major problems in the college. Uh, is, are those problems getting in the way of the college being able to perform to its aims and objectives or to perform as well as it could and should? Is it actually inhibiting the achievement of what we're all trying to aim at? I, I believe that, that it is in our members, certainly the evidence from our members is that their, their working life is very difficult and our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. Um, so if that is interfered with because of all the pressures, then, then it does have an impact. It has an impact on the teaching process. It has an impact on the learning process. So I would say yes, that it, that it does. And what, what are the root causes of the problems? I mean, we can get involved in the, the, the elements of a dispute between management and the unions. That's you yep, know, not absolutely. our remit. Mm -hmm. Our remit is to look at you know, the, the report and the strategic issues coming out of the report. And you know, from where I'm sitting, one of the strategic issues appears to be a weak senior management team. Um, would you agree with that? Uh, our members um, took a vote of no confidence in the management team recently and the, the root causes behind that um, were to do with the business planning. It was also to do with the organisation of our, our workloads and the, the lack of management acknowledgement of our workloads um, as well as a lot of operational issues which are, which are not the business of the committee but which we find difficult to, to resolve on a, on a daily basis. Right. And, and has any progress been made since the committee <coughs> took an interest in this and the report was published? In terms of um, transparency, in terms of us at last being able to look at what the plan is proposed, then there has been a, a, a marked change um, and that much, much more information has been made available to us. Um, I think the, the Unison Unite paper 
you know, suggested that might be too little, too late. Um, but that is that is major progress. It's major progress in that they, they seem to accept that sharing the plan with us is a, is a necessity if the plan um, is expected to work at all. And having shared the plan, what is your view of the plan? Is it robust enough? Is it logical? Is it uh, achievable? Um, no, <laughs> for all of those. We, we don't feel the, the plan. And it's still... So what are the weaknesses in process? In the, plan? the weaknesses of the plan is that the the efficiency measures that they're looking at involve the lecturers working harder, um, intensifying the workload. We recently negotiated um, nationally that there was a reduction from 24 hours maximum teaching to 23. And this plan, in order to, to put in an efficiency measure, what the management have proposed is that we teach the same number of credits, 24 credits, within those 23. So we'll get less time with the students. Um, and that is, that's an efficiency measure. Yeah. You know, they say that it's implementing national bargaining, but it's implementing national bargaining in a way that totally undermines national bargaining and adds to the workload where the, the staff were uh, anticipating, you know, some relief from the heavy workloads. So that, that, that is a major um, concern that we have with the plan. Also, the plan also um, speaks about... Um, higher class sizes. Now, we've had some discussion over these class sizes and we've had some, some assurances that say big classes won't be made bigger. It's the smaller classes that are not filled. Now, that's a, a recruitment and marketing issue to, to our mind um, and not something we can particularly have a, a lot of in, you know, input into. Uh, lecturers can't be expected to pay the shortfall. You know, when credits are reduced and there's less income to the college, it, lecturers can't be expected to make up that 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 shortfall. Um, there is no suggestion that we, we weren't working hard enough. You know, if it was the case that there, there always had been discussions about lecturers having a bit of slack, but the discussions we've had have been that the workloads are already too onerous. So to then add in, you know, an efficiency measure that makes that so much worse, it, it's just not a workable plan from from our view. One of the concerns I expressed at the last meeting when we had the chair and the principal here and other members of the senior management team was there appeared to me to be an imbalance in the resource allocation within the college that seemed to be top heavy with senior management and middle <coughs> management and not heavy enough at the curriculum leader and lecturer level. Um, are you saying that's the case and actually the business plan makes it worse? The business plan makes the lecturers workload worse. Um, in terms of the structure, we've, we've always been un unhappy that the, the structure wasn't properly um, consulted. We didn't get proper consultation on this, the structure. And we see that there are structural issues within the academic structure. It's very difficult to say, oh, this position's too expensive or that position's too expensive. We are, we are happy to engage meaningfully in any discussions over, over um, a structure uh, if that if that needs to happen, what we've been led to believe by management, though, is that um, they just don't get enough money from the funding council, and that that is the cause of it. And because they're not getting enough money for the funding council, then they say their only option is to to have efficiencies, what they call efficiency, which which could in the long term be inefficiencies because if it impacts on student teaching and learning, you know, and could impact adversely on withdrawal rates. <laughs> then, then it's not an efficiency saving even at that. But they say they have no other options other than to do this. And that, that is something that, that we, we find difficult to imagine. Right. And my final question is, I mean, and I think you've kind of reinforced this, I get the impression, as you would expect with a weak senior management team, that the blame for everything lies elsewhere and it's never them. Um, but the key question, I think, from our point of view is... Um, is this senior management team that's there, in your view, is it capable of taking the college forward and capable of addressing the strategic issues, capable of delivering a robust business plan? We, we don't, as I said in our paper, and you know our, our members are, are making clear via vote no confidence, we don't see things getting any better. Um, and the outlook seems very bleak. Now, it's not our job to decide who's on the management team. That's, that's for the board of management um, to make that decision. But morale is very low 
and confidence that things are going to get any better is very low. We will work positively with whoever is in management um, to, to address any issues that, that we can possibly work collaboratively, collaboratively on. Um, but at the moment, at the moment, confidence is not high. Okay. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a theme that seems to be uh, through all this affair is about uh, consultation and planning and uh, lack of engagement on that. Uh, you touched in the, in the beginning there that there is now some information coming forward and there's presumably some better engagement. Would that be true? There, there is definitely an improvement in the information. Um, the engagement, there's, there's an issue that, w that needs to be addressed over what management understand by consultation and what we understand by consultation and what issues that we feel that management should be negotiating with us on and what issues they can consult on. Now, that's clear throughout our paper and through the, out the management paper, you know, that, that, that from our point of view, they just don't seem to understand what the, the position of the unions is and when they have to consult with the unions and consult appropriately. Now, the, the latest version of the business plan, because it's not yet finalised, what we were given an advance copy on Tuesday, late Tuesday afternoon. We then had a meeting, and it was a constructive meeting, and we, we asked a lot of questions, and we, we, we put our views um, <coughs> forward you know, to Derek Smeal and, and Ian Clark, and that was a constructive meeting. But we then have until close of play tomorrow to put in, you know, um, our thoughts to the board of management, who are considering it via committee. Apparently, you know, um, they're they're looking at it. They they're getting the papers on Tuesday. I wouldn't say that's sufficient consultation. We don't have time to speak to our members about it to address their concerns, address their issues, and consultation should be with the unions if there is a a, a union uh, recognised, and it should be with a, a view to reach an agreement. Whereas management seem to think consultation is giving us some information, allowing us to say what we want to say, but not necessarily taking on board our views. And, and I think that's coming across very clearly in the business plan. And that the, the version that seems to be acceptable to management at the moment is very, very unacceptable to us. One thing which... If I can just interrupt a minute. Our second witness, Leah Franchetti, has arrived. If you can indicate to me if you'd like to... To, to add, when, when, when you do, uh, Leah. Colin Beattie. Um, one thing which uh, I was interested in is that the written submission from the non-executive board members suggests that EIS Fella were offered the opportunity to provide cost-saving um, suggestions for the business scenario plan in December. And it was reported at the board meeting on the 18th of June that EIS Fella were engaged with senior management on further understanding the underlying cost pressures in the college. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this offer and how it was developed and your participation in that? Um, we asked to meet with the Board of Management when a, a voluntary savings scheme was announced, which we had not had any prior consultation on. Uh, and it was to express our concerns that we felt that what we needed was an investment in staff, that we didn't feel that we could afford to lose more staff in key positions, lecturing positions and support staff. Um, so we, we asked to meet with them to speak about this and to speak about the workload issues. Um, at that meeting, they did speak about the financial pressures. And as we had done throughout the, the, the previous years, we asked to see the figures. Can we see the budget? Um, and we were, we were told there wasn't a budget. And we asked, why isn't there a budget? Because the budget's in deficit. Um, and we said, well, can we see it anyway? And they said, no, the Finance Committee weren't releasing the budget because it was in deficit. Um, and we said, well, the budget is a plan. So how can we be going through the year without a plan? And we were told, yes, we have a plan. So we said, can we see the plan? No, you can't see it. Um, so, but if you, if you can think of any cost savings, then, then let us know. Now, without any information on which to, to base uh, you know, I don't know what we're supposed to be doing. We were supposed to be saying we can use less paper clips or, or, or things like that. That's not proper consultation. And it's, it didn't give us anything that we could take to our members. And we did say, you know, if it is the case the Funding Council isn't giving us more money, enough money to, to provide further education, then 
let us see the figures and we'll campaign with you shoulder to shoulder if that is the issue. But they, they wouldn't let us see the plan. So to say they gave us the opportunity to suggest cost savings. Yeah, they did. They did say that at that meeting, but it wasn't a, a proper opportunity to engage with the plan. It's a little bit odds with what the non-executive board members have suggested. I mean, at their board meeting, as I said, on the 18th of June, they said you were engaged with senior management on discussing these cost pressures. We were engaged because we were in dispute. Um, and we were in dispute because the, the solution to the cost pressures was to have all the lecturers teaching 24 credits within the, the time that's normally allocated to 23 hours, which also cut the time for the students. Um, we, we did ask if we could see the figures. And at that meeting, they did. They, they weren't sure if they could let us see it, but then they did agree. And we, we attended a, a, a presentation at which they told us we have no money um, and, and showed us the graphs, many of which were later produced in the consultation. Um, but not the business plan. And the, the message we got was it's the funding council that are, are driving these, these efficiency measures. So we were very surprised when they then turned up here and made no mention of that. You know, because the story we were getting told when we have dialogue didn't seem to be the story that they were telling when they came here. There was no mention of the funding council driving through efficiency savings that weren't acceptable to us. There was no mention of that. They said that we were close to a plan. And what has been clear to us was we were well into the plan. The plan started in the previous year without us being able to see it. And what we've got to look forward to, if that's the term that we can use, is more of the same, more cuts to, to teaching and more pressure on staff. So that was the dialogue that we had. So at this moment, what is your engagement on cost issues and so forth with the college? Our engagement is that, that we have looked at the business plan and we've, we've asked a lot of questions, um, but the answers we always get is we have no room to make any more savings. Um, on, on the structure, um, which Alex Neil has, has mentioned, uh, they said that the Funding Council looked at the structure and said that it was in line with other colleges, so there was no scope for looking at, at, at anything structural. What I'm trying to understand is, you know, we've looked at this historical issue and, and obviously there's... Uh, communication issues and everything involved in this. Are we now in a position where there is satisfactory engagement, open engagement, to take this forward? Thanks. Um, I, I think our position is that the, the college, following the last meeting of this committee, have now rushed to consult with everyone and almost no one. I mean, I see that they've supplied a timetable for the consultation, but they've almost gone in exactly the opposite way in terms of engagement with the trade unions because they've put out a plan over the summer holidays when our members are on holiday um, and have had a very, very rushed full staff consultation. There are still not enough time, as Eileen said, for, for proper consultation. Um, and as a very basis, they seem to be ignoring everything that ACAS sets out as in its you know, the basic building blocks of information and consultation with employees. And as, as you've already heard at committee, they have, they're through, I don't know, this is maybe their second iteration of their business plan. And as Eileen says, there's very little option now. It's, it's X amount of cuts or X amount plus one of cuts. And we're not really clear where the college is trying to go. We were quite surprised to hear the college sit here and say, well, um, no, it, it's not. You know, they were asked a straight question about does the college need more money? And we felt there was quite a lot of prevarication, whereas we're being told in the college that actually, no, we can't achieve what we're trying to do because it's the funding council that's stopping us from doing this and we can't sustain what you wish from national bargaining because there isn't enough money. Thank you. Colin? Okay. Ian Gray. So, um, I, I think... Eileen, you've confirmed that what Unison and Unite say uh, in their paper, um, and, and Leah's just confirmed that too, that there has been a shift in the degree of consultation since the first evidence session that we took. Um, but that's, and that's around the business scenario planning, which is an iterative process. I'm not, I can't remember. I'm not sure it was the second iteration. I think it might be even more from the, 
the previous session that we had. So on the face of it, that seems good. But the Unison and Unite paper does reflect some of the, the things that both of you have just said around this coming quite late in the process. Uh, and worryingly, uh, that paper then says, some members, as a consequence, have taken the decision not to engage with the process, which is seen as ticking a box and too little too late. So my question really simply is, is EIS Vela going to continue to take the opportunity, which does now appear to exist, difficult though it may be, to, um, to work with the college management in developing the next iteration of this business scenario planning? Absolutely, absolutely. We we do want to engage positively. There's there's nothing to be engaged. At. There's nothing to be gained by dropping out of it. And I I think although I can't put words in the other unions' mouths, I think they meant ordinary ordinary members. Now they do rely on the unions to speak for them, um, and that that that's why we have a recognised union. The point Leah made about two iterations is two iterations within the college. So two iterations within six weeks or so. The first iteration was presented to the, the staff as a worst case scenario. Um, and this won't happen. This this will scare the funding council, so it won't happen. Staff didn't appreciate that. They didn't appreciate this sort of game playing um, that, that was, you, you know, scaremongering. And especially after all that was said about the sensitivity um, of staff to, <coughs> to rumours, uh, we, we were concerned that this first, you know, we did the first iteration wasn't helpful to be told this isn't going to happen. Here's a plan that's not happening. That wasn't helpful to us. What we needed was a plan that the 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 where was going to happen. Now they have said that there was updates from the funding council, and that is the the iteration. So in terms of consultation, it was from Tuesday afternoon till. Thursday night is our, our chance to look at that. Not a chance to speak to the branch, but we will respond. Um, you know, to to that iteration, but the the consultation still isn't isn't acceptable. And in their initial consultation plan, there was no place. The time scale, the timetable, did not have consultation with the unions. I got the plan, consultation plan, at the same time as every other member of staff. Now, in the past, when it was the voluntary severance, they thought it was okay for the voluntary severance scheme. I think I got it maybe an hour or two. Could you pop up and see me, and I'll tell you oh, we're putting out a voluntary severance scheme. And an hour later, an email comes out. You know that that's not. We will continue to engage, but we need the opportunity to engage properly and to engage with our members when we're engaging. We're, we're a member-led union, so management should give us the information and then allow us to discuss it with our, our members. You know, within our union meetings, and then come back and say this is how our, our members feel, so that we've got a clear view. All staff meetings are are can be very good communication, but it doesn't give you that opportunity to, to properly look through it and address any issues that are arising and, and put forward proposals. OK, thanks. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Thank you, Convener. I think um, a number of issues have been covered, but if, can I just, for clarification, ask Eileen, are you a teaching member of the, the staff? Can you tell me, what is the regulator, regulatory requirement to consult in a situation like this? Apart from good practice, perhaps, but... Well, there's the ICE regulations. Perhaps we could uh, help with that. Thank you. So, New College Lanarkshire hasn't actually sat down at the table and signed, as a new incorporated body, a recognition and procedures agreement with any trade union. And what they're relying on are the legacy RPAs, recognition and procedure agreements, um, from, from the pre-merger colleges. So those recognition and agreements um, set out that the college should be consulting um, with all its recognised trade unions, everyone that's, that's um, been represented in either written or verbal reports today, over matters of uh, appointments, um, business plans, finance, those type of things. The ICE regulations, which I referenced before, are, are, are a tier below that. The, this college is a public body and has a duty to consult with the trade unions. So is it actually breaking a rule by what it's done or not done? Well, we feel that they are in, in, in breach of the recognition and procedures agreement by not sharing the proper information. I, you know, our, our trade unions locally have, have asked for, for a long time 
for the proper financial information and we don't think it's good enough for the college to say, well, look, some of this is in the public domain, go and find it. So what is your um, way of dealing with that then if, if you believe they're not following a regulation or an agreement? Is, well, that, not a, is that something you've pursued? We could pursue it, but we're, we're trying to engage with the employer to bring them round the table. And I mean, I think the meeting that we saw that took place just before the last committee meeting was a sign from the employer that maybe it is time that they shared some of the financial information. But as Eileen was saying, it's very, very late in the day. The college has already gone through at least one tranche of voluntary severance, um, is asking the trade union to volunteer information about making cuts when they feel they're not in possession of the full, full picture. So you're trying to positively rather than recourse to rules and well, regulations. Well, absolutely. I mean, yes. the, the, college is, is, the college is trying to say, and I noticed they said in their written information, that the deficit of, is not of a concern of the trade unions. That's simply false, but we need to know the true financial picture and to suggest, as they have done, that somehow um, this would create stress and anxiety. Well, actually, it's a lack of that information that's created stress and anxiety because in that vacuum people will make up the story. Um, and the college could have done a lot more to engage earlier. And, and okay. although, although they are engaging now, I, I think it's, it's a scattergun approach and it's still not through the correct process. OK, thank you. Bill, do you have any further questions? Well, just to ask, I mean, we've been through, or you've been through quite a long period. I mean, why, why wouldn't you use the regulations to actually move it forward? We may be there. So that might have been my next question. What next then? Yeah, so so we, we, we could go through a formal process. I am heartened to see that the college has sat down finally to provide us with some of the financial information. As the full-time officer that represents um, our members in New College Lanarkshire, I have not yet seen the second um, iteration of the business plan that has been presented to our members, such as the lack of time that, you know, th they've been given a second plan. I, I, I'm not permitted to comment on, on the contents of what I've seen, but we are concerned about what's in it already. That's a quick question. Is there a staff member in the management um, structure on the board? Or um, we, we did have um, an EIS member as a member of the board, but she has re recently resigned um, because, well, I, I, again, I can't put words into her mouth, but she resigned because she was unhappy with the way that the board Presumably that place still exists. That place still exists. And um, have you put someone into that place? Not as, not as yet. Okay. Um, but I imagine you're looking look at, at that. that. Uh -huh. And in okay. terms of the RPA, you're right, we, we, we could, um, there's an argument for me saying maybe we should go into dispute. Our policy has always been to try and avoid disputes. Disputes um, should only be used as a very, very last resort. And as Leah says, we could be there. Um, the vote of no confidence should um, hopefully make the, the Board of Management take more of an interest in these sort of issues. We have been trying to negotiate an RPA with management and it, it keeps getting kicked into the long grass. Okay. I think the way forward is to negotiate that properly and ensure that it's maintained. Thank you very much. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Just uh, a few things to clarify, if I may. Um, Leah Franchetti, if I may come to you first. Uh, just in, in response to on the consultation piece earlier on you said fairly clearly that uh, you felt that consultation had been woefully inadequate my words not yours uh, previously but then you almost said over the summer they were doing too much and the fact that it was during holidays and that wasn't good enough either and it, what I'm hearing from this side is management are almost in a no-win situation they either don't do it enough or they're trying to do it, uh, but you're not happy. No, I, I agree. I do think um, up until till maybe July, it has been woefully inadequate. There's, there's no doubt about it. I now think it's woefully inappropriate uh, to try and meaningfully consult with people during a period of summer holiday. I don't think that really could be taken seriously. And then there's an unholy rush, in my view, to get things consulted on before an arbitrary deadline of the end of September. Now, I understand the college has to put in plans to the, to the funding council, but this is a deadline that's been known about for a long period of time. A meaningful consultation could have taken place over a number of months um, with appropriate um, meetings for, for the trade unions. And I would have expected, when the college does recognise trade unions, that it sits down with those proper staff representative bodies 
first of all before it goes to a wider consultation and you're hearing that you know locally the branch is getting a plan on a Wednesday and has to come back with a response within a number of days I don't I don't think anyone could really look at that and think that was an adequate consultation but there is a deadline you said in September yes the, because so, of the SFC yes but okay. that's been known about for you know months right but when they start to do the consultation so this was so they recognize I, I'm just trying to reflect back I may be wrong uh, they recognize in July that consultation seems to have been inadequate and there's a deadline looming and say we need to sort this out but unfortunately that coincides with a period of holiday how, just help me out because I'm not in the sector how long is the holiday over the summer well about six weeks isn't it yes Eileen Imler? Um, we did agree to come in, the, the branch officials agreed to come in over the summer to discuss the dispute because we were keen to settle the dispute so that the, the start to term wouldn't be disrupted. Management could have taken that opportunity to put a consultation meeting in, show us the business plan. We could then have come back, arranged our branch meetings and discussed appropriately with, with the branch. They did not take that opportunity to consult with the unions. Instead, they put out a consultation. The business plan itself, or the, the current iteration of the business plan, didn't come out until, until later. Um, and so the lecturers came back to this presentation mm -hmm. saying, you know, everything's terrible and it's going to get worse. Well, um, just and if that, I can, that, that didn't help. Uh, if I can direct a question to you on that, Eileen Imler. The, um, earlier on, in response to one of the earlier questions, uh, you, you made the point that what you were hearing from the college is that they have no other options than to take the steps that they're taking. Uh, and you felt that wasn't a credible response. Uh, so it rather begs the question, what other options are you putting forward uh, and saying to the management, well, this is what you can do. You've got a deficit. Here's how you need to resolve it. Well, given that management are telling us that they can't cut down on expenses any further and that there's no scope within the, the, the structure uh, to look you know, look at any, any kind of savings there. We agreed with management that what we needed was more money. Where we, we found a difficulty was when they were asked directly the question, would more money help? They didn't say yes. They said a sustainable budget. And what they were showing us on the board was an apparently sustainable budget, which would have a, a very detrimental effect on staff. But your solution then, just so I'm absolutely clear, mm -hmm. your solution to the situation the college finds itself in is they need more money. Uh, but surely then somebody has to give them that money. So that's the SFC, isn't it? Yes. Um, now, the, the SF, I can't speak for the SFC either, but it seems that, that their, their argument is that they fund us the same as every other college. Now, the way that budgets work, if your income exceeds, if your um, expenditure exceeds your income, you've got two choices. You either cut down in the expenditure or you increase the income. And if they're saying they can't cut the expenditure at all, other than with these you know, inappropriate efficiency members, measures, then it would have to be the income. But the way that, it, the, the, way that the, the funding council decide on the, the income for colleges, I don't know how they decide whether your income will meet your expenditure. Now, if the, the, there are cuts to credits, and I'm led to believe that some of the future cuts to credits are government-led, if there are cuts to credits, then obviously that will give us more difficulties paying the necessary expenses. It doesn't mean that the expenses weren't necessary. And, and we are, you know, publicly funded. We're, you know, it's, it's not like we're a business we can say, let's go out and, and sell more education. If the government won't let us sell more education, then we can't meet those expenditure targets. So I, I can't see, I can't see any other solution okay. other than more money or or severe damage to education. But do we not have to start from the point that uh, there, the, the college is saying to you, it sounds to me, as though the college is saying, look, we haven't got any more. We, we cannot just uh, create a pot of cash. Uh, so therefore, we have to take some difficult decisions. Uh, and the response from EIS Fella uh, appears to be, well, that's not good enough. Uh, Leah Franchetti. I, I, I mean, when do difficult decisions become 
so bad that a business isn't capable of fulfilling its fundamental purpose. And, and that's where we feel we're at, in that if courses are cut or if there are fewer lectures, when does it become the situation where this business is, isn't running properly? I mean... But what do you propose then, Leah? The, I, well, we're not, we're not here to fix the finances of the college. And we heard, the committee heard lots of evidence that there had been problems in merger, you know, and, and, and I see that the, the college suggests that the deficit isn't our concern. That's not our position. It's not that it's not our concern, but it's not the issue of the trade unions to fix. But our position is there isn't, there's almost nothing left to cut. You know, further education, in our view, has, has been ravaged and there's nowhere further to go. It shouldn't be lecturing staff or our support staff, and I can't speak for the other trade unions, but we feel that there, there's nowhere left to go. Um, and so the, the, the system needs to be looked at. Thank mm -hmm. you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener. See, just uh, can I go back to the previous point about representation on the board, Eileen? Uh, the board paper we have in front of us from 10 days ago says there's four staff representatives on the board. Yes, there's... Is that um, correct? There's... South Lan that's the, the regional board, the South Lanarkshire College as well, so they have a, a staff rep. Um, so uh, there will be two unions two there and two, two from us and two, two from, from them, so, so that's, that's four. Yep. So you were saying there was an EAS member who's no longer there, but is there still four or three? Or? No, there's three at the moment in a position right, to be filled. So there there is staff filled. representation on, on the board? Uh -huh, there is staff representation on the board. But it's yeah. my understanding um, that the, the business plan did not get to the full board because it was stuck in the finance committee because it was in deficit. That that was the story we seem to have been told. Okay, but you would need to speak to the board about that. Thank okay. you, Willie Coffey. Right. On, on, on the budget and the issues relating to the budget, the paper we have from Audit Scotland there, I know it was dated -day April, and it refers to financial future financial sustainability. It tells us in here that the college is projecting um, a surplus a forecast and a budget surplus in 1920 of a million pounds. And years following that, it's forecasting successive surpluses. Surpluses, not deficits. Are you, are you aware of these reports from Audit Scotland? And what, you know, what, have you seen the business plan that shows these forecasts? We have seen these forecasts, but they're, they're predicated on, you know, the cuts to the teaching budget. Cuts, cuts to the time that we spend with students, bigger class sizes, 24 credits within 23 hours. That, that's, that's what is predicated on. Um, right. So is, you, is your engagement with the board being, hold on a minute, um, you're projecting budget surpluses, but you're still proposing to cut staff? Is that, is that what you're telling us here? It, it, seems, it seems that... It's cuts, cuts, cuts all the time. Uh -huh. but this is forecasting surpluses uh -huh. in the three years from now, basically. Well, they're saying that they've, they've, they've to show they're in surplus. They also say that the future years right. are not yet written, that, that all sorts of things could change. There's loads and loads of positive things that could, could come in, which would mean then that we would shed staff that we don't need to shed um, and, you know, damage our organisation based on you know, information that, that seems to change very frequently. For now on iteration seven or eight, and, and the information keeps changing. I, I, I don't understand this. I don't understand how, when it's all a forecast, how all this information can keep changing, unless it's the, the funding council saying they're giving more money or less money. But if the funding council say they always fund this, the same, I don't understand it. I honestly don't can, understand can, the, can the process. Establish that. See, see the current draft of the business plan, right? Mm -hmm. Does it similarly and also project these surpluses in the three years from now, basically? Yes. And is that the goal? The, main? the goal, uh, I believe, is to get into a surplus situation. You're, you're saying quite clearly here that those surpluses are only coming about because of reduced staffing levels. Yeah. Is that uh -huh. Re Re uh -huh. Reducing staff and other staff take up, up the jobs that they that we've released the take-up. And, and we've, we've had several voluntary severances schemes, so we've already taken up a lot of the, the support staff roles. And what we've done, as Leah said, you know, it's not that we've we've not been open to the, the difficulties of financial pressures. We've taken on a lot of administration tasks that, that we used to, somebody else used to do. We've, you know, things have been automated, which give us more work. But, you know, we've spoken to the, 
the, the support staff and sort of said, we don't want to take your job and they said, but we are so busy, we would rather if you would do it, that would help. So we have been very proactive and we have helped as much as we can. We're now at a stage we can give no more. Right. And it would be it would be um, irresponsible for us to try. I understand. Uh, just, I'm just final. Speak up a little bit, please. I'll try, I'll, Thanks. I'll, I'll, too far away from Mike. So basically, I think what you're saying is that if these accurates and for, if these forecasts are accurate, that they're, we're projecting a million pounds surplus in each of the next three years, are you saying that the college, college needn't have that surplus, but, re, but obviously invest it in retaining the staff? Is that what you're saying? I, I mean, I'm saying we need an investment in staff and not another voluntary saving scheme that reduces the staff that can do the job that the government seems to want us to do. OK, I think that's something we'll need to come back to the convener. Thanks very much for, for that. Any further points from members? Alec Neil, briefly. Can I please. just raise? I started off by saying, can we deliver? Can you deliver for the students? I've got information that suggests that the credits obtained in New College Lanarkshire are lower than what they were from the combined colleges it replaces. I've also got information that the credits are relatively low compared to similar sized colleges elsewhere in Scotland, and I've also got information that suggests that of all the large merged colleges of scale, New York College Lanarkshire seems to be in receipt of the second highest funding per credit um, outside the rural colleges. Is that information that you would be aware of? And if it's true, um, is that not very worrying? Because at the end of the day, this is all about trying to get these students uh, through the credits that they deserve. It is indeed very worrying because there is this concept of an unmet need um, that we were speaking about yesterday. And it seems to me that an unmet need is interpreted as courses you haven't managed to fill, as opposed to what you would, would imagine an unmet need should be. If, if we've got unmet needs, it means that Lanarkshire is very well educated and they don't really need much more further education. That would be my interpretation of an unmet need. An unmet need seems to be that we're not meeting the needs, therefore we need our credit, our credit target cut. The more you cut the credit target, the less income you have to pay the expenses. So it becomes a, you know, it becomes worse and worse, and that that is why we don't have any, any hope of it getting better. Because the more our credit target goes down, the less income we have to offset against necessary expenses, including the, the teaching budget. And that goes back to the balance between the investment in lecturing vis-à-vis -vis the investment in senior and and. It's, it's also about management. marketing and recruitment and strategic planning yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's about all of this, about saying what, what, what is the job that we're trying to do here. You know, and if there, if there is genuinely no need for the further education levels in Lanarkshire that we've been providing in the past, and I, I would doubt that, if there genuinely is, is no need, then you would need to, to, to look and see, well, what is your cost base if, that is, if that's what you're saving, or you would need to look at the, the, the cost per credit. Can I thank you both very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I'm going to suspend committee until 9.50 for a brief changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Now I'd like to move on to item number three, which is the National Fraud Initiative in Scotland. And I'd like to welcome our witnesses today. Fiona Cordiac, am I pronouncing correctly? Thank you. Director, Audit Services. Angela Canning, Audit Director. And Anne Cairns, Manager, Benefits on the technical side, I believe, all from Audit Scotland. And I'd like to invite Fiona Cordiac to make an opening statement. Uh, convener, thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee today on our latest report on the National Fraud Initiative. Public bodies spend billions of pounds of taxpayers' money for the benefit of the Scottish public population. Spending systems are complex and mistakes can happen. Some people also try to fraudulently obtain services and benefits to which they are not entitled. The National Fraud Initiative aims to help public bodies to minimise fraud and error in their organisations. The NFI exercise is undertaken across the UK public sector every two years and is led by the Cabinet Office. We in Audit Scotland are responsible for coordinating the exercise in Scotland and 113 Scottish public sector bodies participated in the last exercise. The NFI involves comparing large volumes of electronic data that are held by a public body about individuals such as payroll and benefits records. Um, these are compared against the records held by the same organisation and those held by other public bodies to see if there's a match. Where a match is identified, then this might indicate, indicate that there's an inconsistency that needs to be investigated further. All bodies that participate in the exercise receive a report on the matches that they may choose to investigate. And they investigate these so that they can determine whether the match is down to fraud, error, or uh, a, a perfectly acceptable reason. The body can take, then take remedial action, and that might involve uh, correcting a benefit reward, award or recovering uh, any creditor duplicate overpayments, for example, and they also update their records for the future. Exhibit 2 and page 9 of our report gives an illustration of how the exercise works. The outcomes from the NFI include actual amounts for fraud and error that are detected by the data matching exercises, as well as an estimate for future losses that have been prevented by the exercise. Our most recent report on NFI highlights that outcomes valued at 18.6 million have been recorded since our last report back in June 2016. Exhibit 3 on page 12 of the report shows that eight areas generated about 95% of these outcomes. Since 2006-07, the cumulative outcomes for NFI in Scotland stand at 129.2 million, uh, and we think that these results highlight the value of data matching uh, to Scotland's public finances at a time when budgets uh, are under pressure. This committee also carried out a post-legislative post-legislative scrutiny, sorry, I've not got my teeth in this morning, uh, of the NFI last year and produced a report on its findings in September 2017. Your report noted that NFI had helped improve the transparency of public finances and clawed back millions of pounds to the Scottish public sector that would otherwise have been lost to fraud and error. The committee's report made several recommendations for us in, in Audit Scotland, the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Office. All three bodies have been taking action against these recommendations over the past few months. We provided a brief update on these actions in the report itself, and we also prepared a separate briefing for you, which we provided for today's meeting. My colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions that you may have on either the report or the actions that we've been taken in response to your report. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Colin Beatty, please. Thank you, Vera. Um, in 2016, um, this committee discussed a number of concerns which were taken on by Audit Scotland, not the least of them being the participation by public bodies who were receiving public funding in this exercise. Um, most considerably, it was bodies like Alios, housing associations. There was concern that uh, some of the councils were less than good at participating. What progress has been made on this? Uh, it, as, as Audit Scotland, we can only mandate uh, bodies to participate in the NFI that the Auditor General or the Accounts Commission appoint the auditors uh, to. Other bodies can choose to volunteer 
uh, to apply to be part of the exercise, and some have, have done so. We have a number of initiatives in place to try and encourage uh, participation. In terms of the bodies that do take part, over the years since we started the NFI uh, back in 2006, we've seen um, a general increase and improvement in the level of participation from public bodies, and that's, that's a good thing. Now, you were going to engage with uh, the Scottish Government yes. on this very issue. Yeah. What progress has been made on that? Uh, I'll pass you over to Anne Cairns to pick up that, the detail of that question. Thanks, Fiona. Um, as Fiona has said, we have been engaging with the Scottish Government and they have been proactively um, engaging with the housing association sector. Um, at present, we've got a number of housing associations um, who have volunteered to come into the NFI and we're taking this forward with the Cabinet Office in order to get them trained um, with a view to them being able to participate and actually get access to the data and bring in their data with, over the next six months or so. So they will be included in this next exercise? They will be included not in so much in the batch matching every two years, but they'll be included in what's known as the app check. So they are able to check if someone applies for a house in their area, they will be able to go into the NFI system and access the data to check basically what the person's saying in their application is true and verify that they haven't got another house in another part of the country, for example. That, of course, was anticipating a question I was going to ask about app check. Has that been now rolled out to all the all the councils. I know you were discussing this with the government and who would pay, and I think the cost was going to be £1,850 per, per uh, local authority area. A number of uh, councils have actually undertaken a free trial. The Cabinet Office have been offering free trials of AppCheck because it's a fairly new product. They have undertaken, as I say, a number of them have undertaken um, the trial. Next week, we're actually having an engagement session with the Cabinet Office and the IT supplier of AppCheck with all the participants of the NFI, again, to promote it and actually have live trials that they can actually come and see it. And as part of that, we're actually having a couple of our participants to actually do presentations on how they are using AppCheck and the sort of area. So they're not just hearing from auditors or the Cabinet Office, they're actually going to hear from their peers and other local authorities mainly who are using AppCheck to the, their advantage. My concern is we're two years on from when this was first raised and we seem to be just at the point of having a few trials. It doesn't seem very fast. It's worth saying that uh, as auditors we can't mandate what a particular body might use as part of its internal control framework. We can only report and encourage, and we have been doing that through our engagement events. But you are going to be engaging with the Scottish Government to try to see if they could put a bit of pressure on, yeah. and, and if necessary, a change in uh, legislation or whatever to make it mandatory. Because you know none of these none of these participants actually have to follow up on anything. There's no penalty. Um, uh, local auditors would report uh, about anybody that they did not think was satisfactory following up its matches. So it would be reported in the public uh, audit report to that, for that particular organisation. Not really a smack on the wrist, though, is it? <laughs> the other thing is, I'm looking at the, the number of cases that were identified in 2016-17, and they have doubled since 2014-15. And yet... The number, the, the value attached to that, that, uh, that, that potential recovery has only gone from 16.8 million to 18.6 million. And the next step on that is they're actually actively trying to recover 4.8 million. Now, given the effort that has to go into investigating these cases, is that value for money? If they've got 656,000 <coughs> cases to investigate and the amount involved potentially has gone up such a small amount. What is the cost of this exercise? The, the cost of the exercise definitively is quite hard to, to estimate um, because many public bodies don't uh, differentiate between uh, investigating the NFI and following up matches in the NFI from some of their other counter-fraud activities, and nor would we necessarily expect them to isolate the cost of NFI. Uh, in, uh, I think it's paragraph 68, I think, of the report, we do try to give a broad estimate of what the cost uh, of uh, undertaking the NFI initiative is. But what we are clear is 
that uh, we think that the cost is clearly outweighed by the benefits received through the, the, the exercise. In terms of year-on-year -year comparisons between the, uh, this exercise and the previous exercise, it's quite difficult because new bodies have come on and been involved in the exercise, and there's also new uh, data sets that have been used uh, this year compared to the last time we, we, we did the exercise. In terms of the question you asked about uh, the recovery rate of 4.8 million, that needs to com be compared not against the 18.6 million, because that includes um, not actual overpayments, that includes prevented potential overpayments. So the 4.8 million needs to com be compared against the 5.5 million of actual overpayments detected through the uh, exercise. Just look at the figure of 656,000 and think somebody's had to look at each of these. Is there not a cost? I, I think um, it's also worth stressing that a body doesn't have to investigate every single match. What it does, it risk assesses those matches uh, to determine which are the areas that are worth investigating. Um, and which that probably aren't worth their effort in investigating. So if it's a small amount of fraud, they don't bother? Uh, no, no not, not necessarily, because not every match is indicative of fraud or error. Sometimes it can be due, due to uh, a perfectly reasonable explanation. Somebody's got to assess that, yeah. and there's a cost in that. Um, I'll maybe pass you over to Anne, that will mention some of the uh, guidance that is available in the NFI uh, process to help. We spent a bit of time on this point. If you could um, summarise briefly, Anne, that would yeah. be helpful, please. Yeah, when we release the matches, or well, the Cabinet Office releases the matches, um, the Cabinet Office has inbuilt risk scoring in the system. So when a council or a health board gets their matches, there's some that are shown as high risk, they're highlighted in red. There's other ones that are sort of gold, uh, with a sort of gold key. And that's the ones that from the IT system and al analysis of previous exercises that the cabin office actually think are the, the ones most likely to indicate fraud and error. Some of the other matches might just be um, perfectly legitimate reasons or they might actually be getting more matches due to maybe their, um, the data in their system isn't maybe as good as it could be, especially with some of the new matches. If it's the first time a match has been put up, maybe the data in the underlying systems isn't quite as accurate as we would like. Oh, okay. Ian Gray. Um, I was quite interested in the case study three, which is on page 15. Murray Councils tell us once approach. Um, so this is where, uh, when a death is registered, the registrar informs the relevant council uh, and government departments so that the um, bereaved relative only has to, to, to tell them once. Um, and that's a, a system I've got personal experience of and it was very effective. But that wasn't in Murray, it was in Edinburgh. So m my question really is, aren't all councils doing this? And if not, why not? Um, more than Murray uh, are, are doing the tell me once uh, system, as you, you, you found out yourself. Um, but it's, it's not taking place everywhere. Uh, and we'll be pass you over to Angela to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, unfortunately, I had, had similar experience last year and being um, when my mother died. Uh, I was fortunate, though, that um, in contacting the registrar at, uh, um, linked to one council, they had the tell us once approach and actually informed other council as well. So I know from personal experience as well that it's more widespread than just um, it's happening in Murray Council, but we highlighted uh, this particular example because it's um, it's obviously got um, an important impact on on the councils and being able to manage their system as well, but also a really um, positive impact for bereaved families as well and, and only being able to only needing to tell a council once for all the various services that councils provide. So it's it's, it's highlighting highlighting good practice. So is there anything um, what it's called under the accounts commission? I guess it would be could do or is doing to to try and encourage the system to roll out everywhere? Um, I think the very fact that it's, it's in this report highlights um, good practice. Um, what we are um, also working with our communications team in Audit Scotland is in developing um, a hub on our, on our website where um, we're capturing the work that goes on across the piece. 
um, on fraud and counter fraud activity um, that Audit Scotland do and, and are supported by with our, our local external auditors. So that's kind of a, an area that we're developing and hoping to um, highlight good practice, highlight case studies as they come through as auditors notify us of um, fraud examples in councils and, and, and other bodies. We can highlight them and kind of get kind of a more um, um, immediate um, highlighting of good practice. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Just, uh, just sticking with the blue badges, if, just for clarity, do you know, um, so the Registrar informs the Council, the Murray Council, once a death has been registered, do they, <clears throat> or could they, also uh, include information on Council tax and benefits and pensions at the same time, or is it just blue badges? I'll pass you over to Anne, who might know the detail in that one. Thanks, Fiona. Um, when the Tell Us One system works well, it should cover a whole range of services that the council provides. So it would be blue badges, it would be social care, typically benefits, council tax. It should cover the piece. Um, obviously, Mori, we've identified that as an example. It's working well. It does work in other councils, um, but we, we understand that it's not working um, totally effectively in all areas. But the ideal is that it would cover all council services. Yes. yes. Uh, so moving on, uh, keeping with the specifics, uh, but if we can move to council tax. Uh, so on page 13 of your report, at paragraph 26 in particular, uh, you talk about the council tax discount. Uh, and you conclude that the total council tax discount, which has been incorrectly awarded across the Scottish Councils was 4.4 million. Now that's uh, lower from the previous year uh, by uh, about 1.2 million, uh, which sounds good, but it's still a very significant amount. So uh, is there more that councils can be doing to address this? I think in general, there's always more that councils and, and bodies can be doing. Um, to help prevent error and overpayment, such and it, as, and it's one of our uh, one of our recommendations uh, in the report uh, is for councils, and it does concern uh, council tax single per, uh, person discount, uh, and we are just encouraging them to do more. Yeah, just for the record, then, could you point me to that uh, those recommendations in the report? Um, that's on page six. Local authorities should investigate the council tax uh, single person discount matches in conjunction with other data matching uh, suppliers as they determine appropriate to ensure that their awarded discounts are valid. Uh, another point of clarity on the same topic, though. So we've got 4.4 million council tax discount awarded incorrectly. That's come down from last year. The thing I'm not seeing in the report is do you know if these are the same councils? Or in fact, did, did the 5.6 million councils sort it all out and this is a new set of councils or is it the same ones? Um, I'll pass you over to Anne who might know the detail of that one. Thanks, Fiona. Um, I don't have the, the list obviously with me with who, who um, identified a particular amount, but basically it's across the piece, it's across the 32 councils. Um, and it's basically, you know, they've, they've all worked on this area um, and identified more discounts that um, that have that are being incorrectly awarded. Right. So it it sounds like it's a fairly endemic problem. And do you get any sense again, just to follow on from Ian Gray's question earlier? Do you get the sense that the councils are talking to each other to share best practice uh, and, and ensure that they're all uh, doing as much as they can, rather than individually uh, trying to find solutions? We have an engagement event with uh, NFI participants next week, and that is an opportunity uh, for us to facilitate some of that discussion and sharing of best practice. Sorry, can I just add, um, Anne and I attended a meeting just uh, quite recently of um, fraud investigators who work in each of the 32 councils. So we know there are um, forums out there um, for um, people um, uh, staff who are involved in counter fraud and looking at fraudulent activity for getting together, and I think that's uh, very much what they do is share their their learning and examples and 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 hear from each other about how they've tackled things. 
Great, thank you. That brings me on to the point I would like to raise. I mean, we touch on council tax, um, we touch on blue badges, and I think you have all the the data for each <coughs> council. You must Audit Scotland must possess all the data for each council on this. Can you publish it? Um, the, um, the, the, the number of uh, the details of overpayments for each council and matches so, for each council. For instance, on blue, can you refer blue badges is on page fourteen. Mm -hmm. um, Scottish Councils, paragraph thirty two says Scottish Councils have reported correcting four thousand five hundred and five blue badge records where the NFI helped them to identify that the holder had died. And I think following on from Liam Kerr's question, I think Anne Cairn said that fraud is kind of equally spread across all councils. But would there be any harm in Audit Scotland publishing the data? So perhaps we would be able to identify if Aberdeen has a particular problem with blue badge fraud. I'm not suggesting they do, or one council's particularly good at it. I think if we've got this data, is there any reason why it can't be in the public domain so that it can be scrutinised by local authority by local authority? This is actually something we're considering for our next NFI report in two years' time. What we're thinking about is producing a shorter overall report, but with more interrogative data sitting underneath that. So if anyone was particularly interested in an area, they could drill down to uh, some of the, the detail. What currently happens for each individual body is the external audit team will be looking at that particular body's arrangements for uh, following up uh, matches, and they report some of that information in their annual audit report for the body. So for each individual body's report, you may get some of the detail about how many blue badge matches they have, uh, they, they have had and have followed up. But it, in terms of Scotland-wide data, it is something that we are looking at and doing differently next time round partly to try and freshen up our approach to NFI. Ms Cordia, would you agree with me that even by the whole process of publishing the data, that is an incentive for each local authority to actually get a grip of this? If it's all collated on one website together, how each 32 local authorities are doing on blue badge fraud or council tax, discounts or whatever, that's an incentive in itself, that whole transparency? Yes, Okay. Yeah, we think that would be... Positive. OK, in terms of the data for this report, then, can I ask Audit Scotland to write to the committee and provide all the data local authority by local authority, and then we can publish it on our committee website for this report? Um, I, I think I'll look to Anne to see how onerous that might be and how we might have that data. Thanks, Fiona. Yeah, we do have the data, um, but just to clarify, obviously, Fiona, I think, mentioned earlier, we have the actual outcomes, you know, the overpayments recovered, and then we have the estimates. Um, so we, we have all the data of the actual figures and we have the estimates, and these are collated and added together. So it would be an exercise. We'd need to put, you know, do a bit of explanation, but it is possible. Yeah. Perhaps a committee can write to the Auditor General and ask for that information, and she'll respond to see if, if that's possible. OK, thank you. Bill Bowman. Thank you, Convener. In the paper you gave us, there's a, an appendix with recommendations from the post-legislative um, scrutiny review of the National Fraud Initiative, which lists recommendations <coughs> excuse me, and actions taken. Now, uh, the recommendations ask for the Scottish Government and Audit Scotland to do certain things, and in the actions taken, there are absolutely loads of Audit Scotland delivered this, delivered that, has arranged this. But when I actually look at the Scottish Government, um, it says Scottish Government has advised that it will consider whether there is a need to. Um, the Scottish Government <coughs> will look and has advised that it will look to possibly fund. The Scottish Government has advised that it is considering this. Now, I mean, the Scottish Government is a very broad, broad term, and um, you know, are they just you know, embarrassed at all they've done? They're just you know summarising it in a, in a few words, or have they really? taken this on board and are delivering actions? Uh, we have had ongoing engagement with the Scottish Government uh, on this uh, and Anne has been very active in her discussions with them. Thanks. Yeah, we have been, as Fiona says, in regular discussion um, with the Scottish Government and I know um, Mr Mackay wrote to the committee around about Christmas time with the actions they were going to undertake. 
they have been engaging, as I said previously, with the housing associations, and they have got um, a number of them volunteering to participate in the NFI. They are, more recently, they have also been sort of taking forward the business rates and having a look to see if there's more we could do in NFI <coughs> in respect of getting business rates, getting a new data set, potentially new bodies, um, and. Uh, to look at sort of fraud and error in business rates and even at the events that Angela mentioned earlier there's been sort of engagement with some of the local authorities around that and it looks like that will be activity will be undertaken towards the end of this year so they've been sort of doing that they have looked at some of the legislation for example there was a a, a bit of clarity required around um, some of the electoral role and council tax um, legislation and they have recently clarified that um, to say no it's fine there was some previous questions, some of the councils were a bit uncertain if they had the powers to release all the electoral roll information, so they have recently clarified that. So they have been sort of undertaking um, various activities. So you're really reasonably confident there's action underlying these yeah. very general terms? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kerr. Thank you, convener. <clears throat> so the biggest outcome involves pensions uh, and uh, overpayments of pensions or uh, payments where somebody's died and it doesn't seem to have been stopped. Uh, where the NFI has identified cases where the pension's been overpaid or, or should have been stopped uh, and continue to be paid, is the Scottish Public Pensions Agency able to claim any of those sums back? Um, the, the decision about whether it's worth recovering any overpayments uh, obviously comes down to the, the individual uh, public bodies and the, uh, and, and the pension agencies. Um, yes, it will be able to recover some of those payments, but not all. Why not all? Can you help me with that distinction? Uh, in, in terms of any uh, recovery uh, decision, uh, a body will consider the likelihood uh, of recovery and the cost of recovery and whether the cost of recovery will actually outweigh what can be claimed back. Right. Hence, of the 5.5 million in total actual overpayments detected, recovery action is only being taken on 4.8 million. Right. So, uh, so the balance is that somebody's taken a decision that the it, it would be inefficient use of public, public funds, funds to recover it. Yes. Right. And no different from any overpayment. Right. Can you describe, uh, Ms. Cordiac, what's happening in the NHS with GPs who have retired and are going back on a locum basis and out of hours basis? Is this a problem there as well? Um, I'm not sure that we have any particular uh, information on that uh, issue. Uh, I'll pass you over to, to Anne. It's nothing that's came through um, any of the NFI matches. Uh, that's not to say it's not an issue, but there's nothing that's came on our radar through the NFI. OK. OK. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, I don't want to ask you to divulge your uh, secrets about how you scan and, and check these things, but surely if, if someone who's retired then starts working again, that must kind of flag up fairly early on in HMRC systems. You would think that that person's now earning again, but also in receipt of a pension. That, that should happen pretty early on in the process, I would imagine. It's also maybe worth noting that some of the pension rules have changed as, mm. as well, so particularly for some occupational pensions with uh, flexible retirement, it's now perfectly possible to receive an occupational pension and be working. Yeah, but not the same amount, yeah. though, uh, as was previously enjoyed, surely. Otherwise, why would we be looking at this um, £6 million pounds overpayment of pension? Um, Anne, do you have any detail on that? Yeah, um, uh, reflecting back to when this committee undertook a review of the NFI, um, one of the issues that was raised at that point, I think, I can't remember, it's through some of the evidence sessions, was that HMRC isn't currently sort of in the NFI. Over the last year or so, we have been working really hard with the Cabinet Office to get access to HMRC data to allow us to do some data matching and I think in the report we've reflected some 
early success we've had in that we're now using um, HMRC data to verify some of the student awards in Scotland, and that's actually currently underway as we speak. Um, but it is is an issue and we're hoping with that engagement we're having with HMRC and obviously the Digital Economy Act that HMRC, HMRC will be more amenable to be allowing us to access their information on in future. I, mean, I think that's absolutely fundamental, convener, that the initiative can have access to up to date and current data from HMRC. But uh, when you do get it, I mean, is it is it every week you get it, or is it is it every six months or something? How does it work in terms of getting access to current data? Just now for the this exercise, this is obviously a data match um, that ha happens every two years. So the data would be you know collected at a point in time, and then the, the individual bodies would follow it up. Some of the pilot activity we're doing, and also some of the future developments, we're actually speaking to the Cabinet Office and the IT suppliers who do the data matching for us, is getting that on a much more frequent basis. They've increased the frequency of some of the matches just now, some of the immigration, and some of the deceased persons matches, we're getting that a lot more frequently. But some of the other ones, it's only in a two-year sort of cycle. With the app check, all the bodies obviously can participate in that and they do it as and when they need. Um, uh, and obviously not within the NFI, some of the councils, in fact all of the councils, um, have access to HMRC um, real-time information data for their sort of benefit side of things. Um, so they've got that on a daily basis. OK, OK. Uh, I remember, convener, when I was in this committee previously, when the report came up, I asked the question that... Of, of those data matches that you got in a particular year, did we make sure that we checked them again in subsequent years? And I think the answer was no, we didn't really do that. We went on to different scopes and areas. I wonder if you could just kind of update me on that. If if you get a thousand matches this year that yields five million pounds or something like that, do we keep checking that people are not continuing to attempt to repeat their behaviours? Um. That's not something. Um, obviously, the the, ma the um, decision about which matches to investigate is down to the individual bodies, um, but that's uh, focusing on individuals is not something currently that the uh, NFI exercise does. So, obviously, the system, the IT system behind the NFI, when a body or a council or NHS gets the matches, say for the current exercise, they're due to get the next lot in January it does highlight if that match has come up previously. So if there was a match on myself, for example, that would actually be colour coded to say that that match has actually come up the last time as well. Okay, so they are flagged. Any habitual uh, offenders, let's say, they, they are flagged up for further investigation. The match has come up the previous okay. time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I refer you to Exhibit 6, please, on page 23? <coughs> Note 1 says that only two colleges took part in the 1415 NFI, which explains why there's no graph for 1415 under colleges. Did all the colleges take part in the 1617? Um, yes. For 1617, nine colleges took part. Um, for the, the exercise that we're about to start just now, all colleges will, will be participating. The last time in 1617, um, it was nine, the nine largest colleges, because obviously it was under data matching and under the legislation, we have to um, prove that when we're requesting data that it's actually worthwhile, there's going to be outcomes identified. So we requested the data for the, the nine largest colleges and we did get outcomes so that hence we're Remind me again out. how many colleges we have in Scotland? About 20. 20. 23 or something is it? So, okay. Something, uh, yeah, in the 20s anyway. So, looking at the little graph for 16, 17 colleges, it's mainly satisfactory and then there's a yellow bit at the top which indicates it's mostly adequate. If only... By my calculations, a third of the colleges participated. Why is there no represent? Surely that would be unsatisfactory. Why is there no representation of that? Uh, because I, I think the graph only represents uh, the result, the uh, results for those that we have actually asked to participate. It doesn't. Oh, so we anything. only asked nine colleges to participate. Yes. Why didn't we ask all colleges to participate? 
Uh, I think, as Anne said, because um, it, it was new, we wanted to make sure it was worthwhile uh, okay. before mandating all of the colleges. How many NHS boards were asked to per participate in the 16-17 audit? Except the Mental Health Welfare Commission. Ah, okay. Right. And how about local government? Was it all 32 local authorities? Yes. Ah, okay. So why was it only nine colleges? Sorry. Um, because it was a new area for the uh, participation in the NFI. Okay. We were, we were wanting to prove it was worthwhile before mandating. I see. All. So, right. Okay. I understand. Do members have any further questions for our witnesses? Can I thank all three of you very much for your evidence this morning. I now close the public session of this committee. Thank you.